Welcome to Inspiring STEM's podcast program highlighting innovations in scientific publishing and science communications. We are interviewing key opinion leaders and organisations working to advance and quite often to disrupt the status quo. My name is Martin Delahanty and I will be your host. In this week's episode, I'm chatting with Daniel Pollock, who is a consultant specialising in digital publishing strategy and product innovation for companies primarily in SDM and legal publishing. Over a 25-year career, he has held executive leadership and strategic advisory roles in managing products, operations, and change in organizations ranging from dot-coms to complex corporates. Dan is also chief digital officer with Delta Think and is principal architect of their open access data and analytics tool. This tool supports market intelligence and, and strategy projects related to open access. A very warm welcome, Dan, to the program. Thank you, Martin. Great to be here. Just to begin, as always, we'd, we'd love to know a little bit about your background and, and how you got to where you are. Uh, yeah, um, short answer is by, entirely by mistake, I think. Um, <laughs> it's, it's quite typical with careers. So I'm not from a scholarly publishing background. I originally studied uh, manufacturing engineering, how, how to build factories. Um, uh, although my, my degree taught me many things, it was a kind of combined engineering and business degree, and I ended up uh, falling into software development. And then uh, I think I ended up doing a two hour training session for a small medical publisher called Gower back in the 90s. And that is how I accidentally ended up um, in scholarly publishing and really sort of haven't looked back since. It's, um, I think, an area I, I find inspiring and engaging. So over the years, I, I've, I've moved very much from being an, uh, a techie, so I'm now an ex-techie, as it were, to being what we now call a product person, but back in the day it was probably called publisher. And I think that, that tells the story. So I was involved in the early days of the web, uh, helping um, publishers move things online. Uh, and then brief headlines, I worked at Elsevier for seven years, looking at uh, doing new product development in the health science division. Uh, I was then a management consultant uh, and then ran nature.com uh, for three years. So sitting in between classic publishing and editorial, if you will, and technology, again, looking at digital products. Uh, a brief uh, escape from uh, SDM to the more genteel world of legal publishing for a few years. I was, I was on the board of a, a legal publisher there. And, and then, Martin, as you said, I'm now consulting and really working with a variety of organisations, large and small uh, publishers and libraries and consortia. Look, you know, again, look, looking at what um, the continuing advances in digital technology mean and, and how organisations can respond to them. Great. And of course, for uh, in terms of digital and SDM publishing at the moment, that primarily means open access. So the, yeah. I'll throw a big question your way to begin. So how, how big is open access? Yes. How, how much open access is there? So uh, my short answer is I think roughly half of it. So we think by the end of this year, 2023, about half of scholarly peer reviewed output is going to be published open access, by which I mean open, uh, freely, uh, free to read uh, and free to reuse. So under usually a Creative Commons uh, license that allows some sort of reuse uh, with or without restrictions. So that's the short answer is about half of it. However, Martin, if you'd asked me the question a couple of years ago, so how much open access was there in 2019? So let's go back a few years. Uh, I could pull two numbers at you. Uh, I, I could say that it was either 10% or 53%. And I bring that up because both of those numbers are entirely defensible numbers. The 10% comes from a very recently published report by the Open Scholarship Initiative. It came out, I think, about April this year, 2023. Um, and that 10% is looking at how much or the proportion of output uh, that are articles and reviews but that are published in fully open access journals under the most permissive CCBY, so attribution only licenses. And then compare that with a 53%, which was tweeted for the same year uh, by uh, um, an organisation called Unpaywall, or that's now a product actually part of, of our research. And that's really looking at anything with the DOI, with a digital object identifier that's free of charge to read but may, of course, not be free to reuse. And so the point is, um, it really does depend how much open access is there, it really does depend on how you define it, on your perspective uh, and, and, and which areas you're looking at. Um, 
And then just to, to hammer that point home, I, I, I then uh, may, uh, have an example. If you imagine there was Dan's Institute of Physics publishing, which thankfully for physics and for science in general there isn't, but just for the, <laughs> the, for the sake of discussion, uh, let, let, let's assume there is. Um, you know, if I was advising Dan's Institute of, of Physics Publishing, well, I'd say, well, look, yes, on average in 2023, we think about half of output will be open access. However, in physics and physical sciences, it's about 40 for zero percent is open access. But if you, Dan, are publishing, let's say, in high energy physics, about 90 percent of papers in high energy physics will be open access, whereas barely 15, 15 percent um, in um condensed matter physics for example would be open access so again it really does vary on on your perspective so i'm, I'm sorry martin a very long answer to a very simple question but i, I hope that gets us into a notion but, of how much but but I, I think a very important uh you know segue into to analytics and looking at the mm. the, the detail under the numbers the big numbers yeah. of open access and I, I guess you know initially there you're talking you know open access to include free to access Whereas you know th those of us that are maybe more familiar with open access being underpinned by Creative Commons licenses, yeah. that um, you know we, we try not to conflate open access with free to access because you know, we, uh, yeah we, we uh, uh, absolutely uh, um, and I think you raise a good point that, that um, I, I always advise people when they're looking at numbers or listening to numbers uh, do you try and be aware of the definitions that your source uses. So you're absolutely right, Martin. Open access, um, strictly, there, there was the, what was it, the, the um, Budapest Open Access Initiative back in 2002. Yes. So there's a series of meetings amongst some academics that came out with, if you like, a formal definition of capital O, capital A, open access. And that's the free of charge to read and free to reuse with, with only the constraint being attribution of authorship. But you will all also hear uh, entirely credible sources use open access to mean uh, that plus free to reuse. So if we think about the um, US's OSTP's public access policy, I, I often use public access to controls with open access to separate the two. But yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and ironically, e even companies that specialise in capital O, capital A open access. So looking at some, something like the uh, our research people who are very much looking at open solutions, they will use open access to mean both. And they've coined the term bronze open access to mean mm. public access mm. or free to read or free access. And, and then they'll, they'll talk about gold and, and hybrid um, in, in those respective types of journals. So, yeah, absolutely. If I, I, I tend to joke with people in this sector. If somebody can think of it, the chances are a publisher is trying it out. And I think that goes for definitions as well as business models. Exactly. Or, or don't quote me on that. Exactly. And I, I just... Uh just recently ran a, a seminar on, on copyright, which mm. you know, was you know, primarily focused on open access, but uh, introducing the uh, concept of the permissive meter, where yeah. we can determine a whole range of uh, yes. uses for free to access content yeah. uh, underpinned by you know, typically these Creative Commons license, but it's a very complex landscape. Yeah, But also yeah. I think a great point that you bring up uh, particularly for those, you know, those in publishing looked, looking to opportunities to develop new journals in uh, specialist and niche areas. You know, um, mm. it may have been the case, you know, 10 years ago that you know, the predominance of clinical and biomedical sciences at the front wave of op open access uh, uh, blurred and, you know, overshadowed other areas like physics, chemistry, maths. But yeah. The, the devil is in the detail, as you just say, the difference, mm. the difference between, you know, high energy physics and condensed physics and, you know, breaking it down to that granular level yeah. does also demonstrate that there are variations in the, the uptake and adoption of open access yeah. within those sub disciplines. Absolutely. Variation between and within. Mm. So there's no, mm. the short answer is there's no short answer. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, as a general rule, we'll probably find the sciences that um, use open access on average more than the arts and humanities um, and social sciences. So that probably reflects the cultures in those disciplines and also reflects the funding flows of research. So, you know, if it, if it costs you 
two or three thousand dollars, which is roughly the average fee for a, an open access article in the context of a high energy physics research grant, which could probably run to hundreds of millions. Mm. Of course, that's small beer, whereas um, that could be half your entire grant if you're researching something in, in the arts and humanities. And I dare say there'll be arts and humanities researchers out there saying, gee, I'd love to have four figures in my grant. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm working three jobs to make this, this meet. So yes. you're absolutely right. It's an incredibly complicated and nuanced landscape and and really that's what sort of caused delta thing and myself to, to pull this data together because we we found that when you're doing consultancy projects um yes there'll be common themes open access copyright whatever it might be but the nuance really does vary and we we, we wanted a way of sort of pulling apart the detail behind the headlines um, I, I don't know about you, Martin, but I've seen many strategy presentations that will cite a headline, you know, the scholarly market's worth $20 billion a year, and then go on and talking about, you know, right, well, I want to publish something in cheese making. Um, and I've, I've often wondered, there's not really a connection between those two statements, other than it kind of looks quite good for the, the corporate powers that be. So, no. Yes, but absolutely. again, uh, you know, your, your, your analytical expertise now and the tool that you, you know, you developed with Delta Tink relies on uh, metadata and you've, mm. you've you've talked before about data hygiene which i, I love that term actually that's a, a yeah. nice a nice term maybe you could talk a little bit more more about the uh you know the role of metadata and data hygiene yeah, yeah. so um <laughs> absolutely data, data hygiene <laughs> um so I, I you know metadata is information describing content that that that's the the working definition it's and it's um one of those things that i think especially in the scholarly publishing and and scientific research academic research has always used it to a degree you know we we the, the journal impact factor for example is a classic piece of metadata it's been going since i think is it the 70s when eugene garfield conceived it so sort of metadata is not anything that's new but what happens is when you move everything to a digital format it becomes a lot more exacting and because computers can process this stuff at scale any tiny inconsistencies or gaps really do get thrown into sharp relief. And so when we talk about data hygiene, this is really just making sure the basics are covered. Uh, so for example, um, most, I think most research articles now will probably go and get a DOI, a document object identifier. So this is just a way of uniquely identifying a piece of content. It could technically apply to any piece of content. Um, um, in our um, sector, we happen to go through Crossref as a sort of an organising um, or an organisation that helps us organise this stuff to, to get our, our DOIs. Um, and then in Crossref, you can then classify what your piece of content is. So is it a book chapter? Is it a conference proceeding? Is it a journal article? And when I talk about data hygiene, the journal articles bucket can contain... The sort of peer-reviewed stuff, so that classic primary research paper that I think we're probably talking to or alluding to here, but it can also include retractions. It can include uh, op-ed pieces. It really can include anything that, from a sort of print perspective, you might consider to be a quote article in a, in a, in a sort of bound publication. And that's where this stuff starts to fall apart, because if, if, for example, we want to measure how much open access is there, we really need to talk about that peer-reviewed paper stuff hopefully you know what I mean, and set yeah. aside all of, all of the other stuff that, that some publishers might call, you know, front matter versus back matter. Um, you know, different people will have different names for it. And it is amazing how messy that is. And what you end up with then is very different numbers even coming from the same source mm -hmm. because different publishers may draw the definitions differently. Uh, some publishers may only put peer-reviewed journal articles into that journal articles bucket others may throw everything in there um many publishers may be inconsistent with their use of, of metadata so they may not have dois at all especially smaller publishers because dois take money and so on and so forth so we, we see a lot of challenges just describing what we do and my poster child example on that is if you asked how quickly open access was growing so let's take ourselves back to, to early 2021 we're I think in about February or March 2021 and, and um, the Scholarly Kitchen, which is an online discussion forum, again, very credible source. Um, I'm sure you recognize it. Yeah. Um, they published a piece saying, well, how much had fully open access content grown in the year just ended in 2020? And they came out with a figure of 26 percent, so it's a huge amount of growth. It, that was actually the upper end of a range. Um, 
But unfortunately, what happened after that piece was published was that uh, a number of uh, print issues of journals came out. And so articles that have been published electronically online ahead of print in 2020 had their quote publication year moved from being 2020 to 2021 as they were then slotted into the print um, editions and that had the effect of reducing the volume of output in 2020 and sort of moving it into 2021 um, and that led to this particular piece being republished uh, and restating that growth figure as eight percent down from 26 percent and simply down to what I would term poor data hygiene I mean really can a publication year change in retrospect question mark I mean I don't know Martin you're no. you have a publishing background what do, what do you think See that that would have been you know completely opaque to me until you mentioned mentioned that you yeah. mentioned that before as well. So I mean it's these the, the 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 details within the data and how the data can then you know, be interpreted differently yeah. creates a challenge at the you know the the, the higher strategic levels within organisations mm -hmm. that are looking at you know, the the bigger numbers and looking at the yeah. you know growth patterns and differentiation within subject areas. Uh, and, and and also you, you've then got to time your data because if you take the reading too early before some of these kind of industry sort of tectonic plates, if you will, have shifted, you are going to get very different data, very different readings and, and therefore very different answers. And of course, if you're making plans based on that, you know, your plans could radically alter, I would I would dare say, if, if you knew something was going to go at 26% versus 8%, that might, you know, affect a few management decisions. Although I, I joke with people either way, a lot of my pensions would be growing at even the lower number. Um, <laughs> yes. But, uh, you know, nonetheless, you know, it, it, it makes the point that, that um, I think the way we collate and define and manage data, is, it, it seems like a very arcane conversation. Is it really publishing? But in actual fact, I think it's quite vital if, if we want to measure and understand the patterns and, the, yes. and and therefore then project out the trends and possible future trends in mm -hmm. what we're doing. Um, and, and there's an old saying amongst data scientists that you, you, you know, you spend about 90% of your effort cleaning the stuff up and 10% of your time actually doing the analytics piece and, and, and the interesting yes. stuff. And I, I think that. So you, you, you mentioned DOI, Dan, and that that's, you know, long, long, well-established and Crossref mm -hmm. as uh, an intermediate organization, bringing all that data together. But then, um, you know, how much use do you make of the the other uh, metadata items like persistent identifiers, such as ORCID, uh, and any uh, any others that are being developed? Um, how important are yeah, they to it's your? It's a good analytics? question. We 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 have a <laughs> we have a lot of lot of these, don't we? So um, we gather a number of data sources, and it's actually those data sources that do quite a lot of the heavy lifting. So our primary source now is Open Alex, which is a sibling of Unpaywall and part of the our research group, and they are a not for profit group based, I think, out of the West Coast in the US. Um, they're, they're pulling together a number of different data sources to, to, to try and if, if provide, if you like, an index of the corpus of scholarly content. They, in turn, I think, inherited a lot of data from the old Microsoft academic graph. So that's the, the kind of history getting very geeky there. But what you'll find is there's a number of identifiers coming together. So that I think they've recently added funders. They've got authors. They, they bring in DOIs. Um, they'll also then bring together things like sort of PubMed identifiers in an attempt to try and say, well, if we have a piece of content, can we exactly and unambiguously describe what it is, how you might locate it in a number of indexes, and then you know who the contributors are and who the funders are to it. Um, I can't off the top of my mind remember what they use for their author identifiers. I believe they're beginning to bring in ORCIDs. Um, although of course, you know, an orchid is an interesting thing. I, I was involved in in um, the early early days of, of of actually implementing an orchid on a real publisher's website back at Nature. And of course, the thing with orchid is one author can have several orchids because orchids may be produced by publishers. And and one of the I think the great things that the orchid organisation do is allow you to bring those together. So you can you can identify your author and and sort of disambiguate orchids. But then equally, not every author will have an orchid. So the question then happens, how, you know, how, how do you deal with them if, if not? Um, and that's where organisations like on payroll or cross, where if I, you know, do, I think a lot of heavy lifting behind the scenes to tidy, disambiguate, you, you know, use various um, automated and what we now term artificial intelligence techniques to, to tidy things up. 
Um, but essentially, I think you know the cross ref, mm-hmm. the, the DOI seems to be the, the you know the identifier of choice orchid for uh, authors. Uh, there's the sort of fund ref for funders. There's in a couple of moving parts for uh, identifying institutions. I think that there's Ring Gold and uh, the other one that somebody I'm sure will, will, will mention in the comments if you have them. Um, and so I think standards seem to be coalescing, uh, although it, it's still, I think, quite a, a complex landscape out there. Yeah, as you say, very still very complex, but you're know, beginning to come yeah. together with you know a greater uh, a diversity of, of these ideas. Yeah, you know, persistent identifiers and other metadata yeah. items as well. Right. And um, I suppose, sorry, one other so thing on be, that, Martin, is, is how we identify journals. Yeah, um, yeah, which is I find slightly ironic, given it's the it's the sort of fundamental uh, unit of production in the subscription world. Um, we're not actually that good, <laughs> good at identifying journals. So there is the ISSN, the International Standard Serial Number, but again, a journal can have several of those. Um, there is something called an ISSNL um, or a linking ISSN where, where one of the many journal identifiers is nominated as sort of the definitive one, you know, the, the ring to bring them all together. Um, but I find it interesting. Very few people are aware of the ISSNL as, as a unique identifier. And even then, quite often new journals may not yet have an ISSN. They often don't get it until they're you know, they finally publish, but they may, of course, be accepting papers and submissions well before that. So even identifying, you know, some of our basic units of output, as it were, proves a challenge. And, um, you know, you, you only need one or two exceptions in a long list to, to then have to go back and, and you know, um, deploy quite a bit of work to tidy it up. Uh, so there yeah, we go. Exactly. Um, so we've, again, it'd be fair to say that we've, We've experienced through the advent of open access quite a disruptive period in in mm-hmm. SDM publishing. Um, so, you know, where where do you see us going from from here? Yes. Uh, what what is the the small question? What does the future look like? Um, so the, the usual disclaimer: making predictions is always hard, especially when they're about the future. So this this is this is all about looking at trends in the numbers. Um, I think a, a, a few themes. Uh, again, it very much will depend on who you are. So, you know, where you're publishing, if you're a publisher, uh, what your area of research is, if you're a researcher. I think that, you know, we have got to attach that caveat. On the whole, open access output is growing much faster than average output. So there's, there's so it's basically taking share, if you will. Um, a couple of interesting things when we pulled apart the numbers on that. So I said by the end of 2023, I think roughly half of output, so half of papers published will be open access. But the corresponding revenue that that brings into publishers or, or basically money that's being spent um, by, by funders or, or libraries um, will account for about 15, one five percent of that, barely that. So this is sort of huge disparity between how much stuff or share of stuff and share of money that that stuff accounts for. Um, now, although the money accounts are a relatively small proportion of it, again, it's growing very quickly. So if you look at how fast the value of the journal's publishing market is growing, roughly half of its growth in value is accounted for by that small share of value of open access, which I find fascinating. And so I, I think we're seeing an industry in transition uh, where more and more content is going to be open and then it's a somewhat of an open question as to how quickly whether there'll be sort of like an elastic effect of that slow revenue suddenly catching up to match open output or if we'll actually find the total value of the the public uh, journal publishing industry starts to um, reduce slightly because on average uh, publishers make less revenues per paper under open models than they do under subscription models so there's that classic digital disruption that we've seen in, I think, many other industries that, you know, what I think, you know, in the old newspaper industry, old news, news print industry as it was, the old thing was, you know, it yeah. takes 40 digital subscribers to replace one print subscriber. Uh, I don't think we'll have quite that um, exacting uh, uh, or, or huge gap in, in scholarly publishing, but certainly I think there will be a gap. It's a little bit hard to, to say exactly where that will land up. Um, certainly, I think there will be a lot more open. I mean, inevitably, that seems to be where a lot of policies are heading. 
and, and there is an argument that says, of course, if, if this stuff is largely paid for um, by public funds, then there is an argument that the public should have um, some, some sort of unfettered access to that. Um, and I'll, I'll let people shout at me on Twitter for raising that one. Um, but I think nonetheless, there seems to be a driver uh, there. But I very, very much doubt whether it will be 100% open. Um, I think we, we have such a complicated and, and nuanced landscape that, you know, as I say to people, if, if you're if you're publishing a really, really widely read journal like Nature, you could argue that charging many people a very small fee to read it is the most equitable way of sort of distributing the cost of that. Uh, whereas if, if you publish in, you know, Dan's Institute of Physics, cheese making in high energy physics, which is going to be read by, let's be honest, the author and probably the author's mum, um, you know, really, is it then fair to expect the whole world to pay for that? And you, you might argue the more equitable way of paying for those much more niche areas of research is through some sort of paid publication model. Um, again, I, it's, my, it's not my job to advocate one or the other, but to make the point, I think that there's likely to be a, a, a continue to be a mix of business models um, as we look ahead. Uh, and then also it's worth noting that our industry changes very slowly. So we've been talking about open access for the better part of quarter of a century we're only halfway there in terms of output and barely 15% of the way there in terms of revenue. So I, I suspect this, this runway has got some, some way to go yet. Um, so uh, mm. I hope that gets some of the big picture stuff. Um, interested in your thoughts, Martin, you've, you've lived this dream to a, a degree, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it is extraordinary what's happened even in just uh, the last uh, three or four years. Uh, when you know we look back to a longer period where you know from from Budapest onwards you know open access was you know beginning to to generate mm. uh, discussion but you know we've definitely seen also the the meteoric rise of fully open access publishers such as yes. uh, frontiers and dowie and and in particular mdpi mm -hmm. uh, which you know tibet well you may tell me otherwise but depending on, on which report i read uh, it, it's the the biggest open access publisher by volume yeah uh, yeah i'd agree with that seems to see what, what, what the numbers are saying and you know i think maybe that uh, sort of uh, that meteoric rise and the extraordinary growth, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it appears to have created some problems and cracks in the the filters for research integrity. And so we're seeing yeah. maybe uh, an increased number of retractions and uh, uh, challenges to uh, uh, the journal's integrity. Do you, do, you, do you see that continuing? Is that is that a really a significant issue? What are your thoughts on, on open yeah, access um, I, and, the, and the high competition and, and the large volume impacting on research integrity? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, I think in terms of research integrity in general, I think that is going to be one of the central questions that all publishers need to be dealing with. Um, there have been famous retractions from subscription journals over the years, uh, as well as uh, in, in, in open journals. So um, I think, you know, we live in an age of disinformation, um, you know, we've got to mention AI and chat GPT and these generative tools that, that can produce very convincing narrative output. Um, and so, you know, you feed all of that into the mix. Um, then I think that the challenge of making sure that what we publish is as close to the truth as we can get it. Uh, and we know the truth is complicated and slippery. You know, that will continue to be a thing. And meanwhile, of course, getting published again, whatever the publishing business model um, but getting published is so vital for a researcher's career. So we have that whole conversation about, you know, the, the quest for to get published in a journal with an impact factor. Um, I haven't found anybody that says that's a really good way to measure true impact of research or of a researcher or of a funder. But nonetheless, it seems to be the yardstick by which everybody's measured. Mm. And, and that is inevitably therefore going to be open, I think, to to bad actors and unscrupulous players and, and just people who are desperate, who have to get published in order to get that promotion, get that new position, feed their family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think all of those things are at play and therefore, yeah, absolutely, um, research integrity per se, I my personal view is going to be one of the defining sort of issues of conversation over the next few years as we wrestle with this. And then we factor in those business models that really do reward scale, probably more than 
um, others. So you know, if you publish, if if you get, um, if you can realise revenue from every uh, unit, every paper that you publish, of course you just publish more stuff, you make more money. I do hate the world, of course, all legitimate open access publishers will separate church and state so that, you know, the, the publication fee doesn't affect the editorial decision. But nonetheless, the economics are what they are. In a subscription model, the only way you can um, meet the ever increasing growth for demand in publications is to basically start more journals and, and therefore justify putting your prices up. So the economics of those two models work very differently. And, and, and I think the open models, therefore, tend to be more immediately responsive to changes in demand. And I'd argue, therefore, you know, yes, it, 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 as, as publishers struggle to scale up quickly, that's where some of the cracks can appear, especially if, if they start to outsource some of the editorial oversight, which I think that, that that's the sort of cause behind some of these, these um, research integrity issues around special editions or special issues, which we've seen. Um, that said... Digital disruption is normal. You know, we we've seen bumps in the roads of everything. Um, you know, uh, I, my favourite story is about the motor car. Uh, most people have heard of the Model T Ford. It was when you know it accounted for half the cars sold on the planet back in the nineteen twenties and thirties. Still, I think about the seventh or eighth best-selling model of motor car ever. Even you know the better part of a hundred years later, and yet. You could not operate a Model T Ford today. The controls operate so differently from a modern motor car. The point being, we see these weird blips in innovation that, you know, as as we move from old to new, as we adopt new technologies, there will always be false starts, blind alleys, things that we look back on and just say, well, that's absolutely weird. Why, are, you know, or why aren't we using that thing when it was so common? And so I, I therefore think the, these issues with research integrity, especially around the open publishers, um, I, I think we're going to figure them out. You, you know, I don't know how exactly. Uh, I, I dare say there'll be a lot of technology involved there, but I, I see them as, as sort of part of that, that, that the sort of the, the bumps, the ups and downs that we'll see as, as part of any digital or technological transition. So in that sense, I think I'm a real optimist about it. Um, and I certainly hope we do, because my view of... of our industry is is we're arguably the one industry that really does trade on the objective truth. You know, if if, if you're publishing, if, if you're peer reviewing a piece, the idea is to try and independently verify it. Is that the truth as as we understand it? We're not the newspaper industry that might be supported by um, wealthy owners with 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 agendas. You know, we're not a lobbyist industry. We're not advertising. So, you know, I, I really do think we have a vital and increasingly vital role to play um, to, to act as that sort of trusted source so people can then sense check all the other stuff that's coming out from the, the bots, the Twitters, the Facebooks, you know, other social media are available, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, so on the whole, a bump in the road, a vital issue, but, I, but one I th I'm op quietly optimistic that we, we, will, we will solve and we'll figure out. That's great, and I'm I'm with you uh, on the uh, the optimism side, and uh, I think you know, open access may uh, and you know the the race to you know, creating larger volumes of uh, open access uh, across all publishers and the advent of the the new fully open access publishers, uh, the fact that these research integrity issues are, are coming up, it's as you say bumps on the road, but I think it's just shining a you know, applying a lens to pre-existing, long-standing yeah. issues with research integrity, exactly. it just yeah. you know, allows you know, a, 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 I guess, a more focused view. But you know, I, I keep telling you know clients that I work with that I don't want all of this currently to overshadow the benefits of open access and the true benefits of open access mm. to, you know, as you say, you know, uh, in terms of science communications to have, you know, as best possible, a, a unbiased perspective, uh, but, you know, ultimately to advance, you know, the scientific endeavor to advance healthcare society, you know, all the yeah. good things that, you know, providing open access and reuse of data, you know, can, you know, deliver. You know, and I, I think that will continue. We just have, again, these these bumps in the road, which are, I think, yeah. necessary just to smooth those out. And, um, and just, I think, understanding how to handle and manage the, the you know, exponentially increasing volumes of information and data, just raw data points that are mm -hmm. being generated. Mm -hmm. 
you know, as you think of any research endeavor, and it could be in the in the in the arts as much as in, in the sciences. Um, you know, if people are using computers to generate data points to analyze things, they can generate vast volumes of information that then need automated techniques to process, and and that's ultimately how you know how we're doing things. You know, look at say the banking industry that will process billions of transactions a minute around the world and have to get everyone absolutely correct. Um, you know, and then think about I don't know a gene sequencing machine squirting out again you know terabytes of information in, in short amounts of time. So inevitably, the way that research is being conducted has evolved and is evolving, and publishing inevitably is going to have to change. I think to keep up. So you know the, the notion of supplementary information it made sense in the print world where you, you know you you might have something that just was not economic to to put into the the print volume of a journal. Uh, it was therefore quite literally supplementary but now of course data is the f the core of everything really you should be citing data as the basis for the assertions you're making in a paper you know we, so we've arguably got some work to do to catch up our systems and processes become more data savvy and aware um, and then work out how we can work with these big infrastructure providers because a lot of this stuff requires huge scale infrastructure to store and manipulate and again that's just that's not a publishing thing why, why should it be we're about acting as the filter at some point in this in this much wider process so you know i, I can see things for example preprint servers uh you know so-called post-publication peer review you know these are all ways of applying our filtration skills and insights you know just in a different way to a this, this much larger corpus of content so i think there's going to be some interesting changes in methodology uh, that, that we're, we're inevitably challenged with. But again, you know, I think you're right. It doesn't get away from what makes a, a fundamentally sort of a good editorial decision. I think that that's a kind of timeless, timeless thing that we, we, we must be careful to, to cherish and to nurture. Dan, this is, this has been a, a, a great conversation and, and a, a nice deep dive into, uh, analytics, uh, related to, to open access. Uh, we, we did touch on, AI and chat GPT, that would take us down mm -hmm. a, a rabbit hole from yeah. which we probably wouldn't emerge for a few hours. That would, I think that would be another great conversation to have. So yes, we can you know, park that for, for the future. Yes. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm aware that you're, you know, you've just come back from STM uh, conference in the States and, you know, you're, you're presenting quite frequently and, you know, you, you're, you're blogging as well. Where, where can people, uh, see more from you over the next coming months and what what kind of projects might you've been involved with um so on on the delta so basically if you go to delta think.com um delta and think are spelt exactly as they as they sound.com um that that's the blog I, I write monthly pieces for them so you, you can find those on their website um and the the output of this tool uh, i'm just about to start our annual sizing Runs that in, that involves uh, interviewing or, or surveying some publishers, and we'll, we'll typically publish that um, early autumn, early fall, when, when we've crunched all the numbers. So that will be the, the kind of the, the next big thing. Um, I will be at the ALPSP conference in Manchester. That's sep that's mid September, I think September thirteenth through the fifteenth, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, and, and then, yeah, you know, I mean, other than that, I think, yeah, do get in touch via, via the Delta Think website and be happy to chat or, or follow up with things. Um, and then the, the monthly blog posts we put out, they, they're free of charge. They are in actual fact open access under a Creative Commons um, non-commercial license, as, as I remember. So we, we do try and Very walk good. the talk a little bit. Um, and there's all contact details there, there as well. And there's a mailing list that people can sign up to free of charge if, if they want um a monthly small amount of data discussion and then get that little fix there. That's great. Thank, thank you so much for sharing that, Dan. I'll make sure I include the, the links to thank all the you. items that we mentioned through the talk and obviously your contact details as well. But yeah. for the moment, thank you so much for a great conversation. Uh, and I look forward to the next opportunity to chat, but for now, I wish you all the best. Thank you, Martin. Thanks for having me on. Oh, yeah, I look forward to that that uh, chat about AI. We'll both have to sit there with Chat GPT and see if we can uh, act as the conduits for them. Yes. That might be an interesting experiment. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Bye I for look now. forward to that too. Thanks again. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye.